Hello and welcome to another episode of Bare Bones Wargaming, a show with no bells, no whistles, no frills, just a man, a camera, and his game. All right, today's episode, uh, it's kind of filling a hole. I'm a little surprised. Um, I've been waiting for a new game to show up that I've been chomping at the bit, uh, champing, sorry, champing at the bit to get a hold of. Um, the uh, Lost Valley, about DMVM Few from White Dog Games. Um, DMVM Few being one of those topics that, I don't know, I'm sure you guys have this kind of thing too, where, you know, a lot of the times, you know, my topics are heavily into World War II and, uh, you know, Napoleon and stuff, and I rarely go into more modern warfare. Uh, but Denver and Few is one of those things that's always fascinating me. So I'm kind of hoping that this game, I've tried a couple already, hoping this game will work out. Anyway, allegedly it's supposed to be here tomorrow. So I'm not going wood. I'm holding, I'm holding my breath. I think it's going to be more like Monday. But in the meantime, I've been playing a couple of my old favorites. I just played a couple of games of Stalingrad Inferno on the Volga, my 21st and 22nd play. So it tells you what I think of that game. But then, as you can see in front of me here, probably a lot of you recognize this game. Uh, this game... It was one of the very first games I did when I started this channel, The Fires of Midway, um, from Clash of Arm Games by Stephen Cunliffe. And I was looking it over, and I was like, holy Toledo, Ohio, I've never done a review of this. I was like, no, can't be. Uh, but it was. So, since I had it on the table, because of course this is one of my games that I enjoy, it's quick, easy, playing, easy, tear up, or set up, tear down. I thought I'd go ahead and do a review. Um, I've even done a written review on Board Game Geek. I was surprised when I started digging through my old reviews. I was like, whoa, holy cow. So, um, we're going to fix that. I guess that's the best way to put it. As you can see here from my current play, I'm not doing so hot. <laughs> you probably see here in the foreground, Enterprises damaged, Yorktown's damaged, Lexington's damaged. The only good thing over here is that I sunk the uh, Shokoku already in the game, but I'm still losing to the Japanese bot. More about that here in a little bit. So, since we're doing a review, y'all know what that means. Boom, 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 boom. <whistles> womp, womp, womp. It's the good, the bad, and the ugly. All right. So, let's start off with the good. So, the good for the game. Uh, one thing I like about this game is it is a fairly simple system, but it is effective. Uh, it conveys the tension, the swings of carrier warfare that went on in the Pacific in 1942. Uh, it, this is, of course, compared to Carrier, which, of course, is a classic from Victory Games. Um, and by the way, if you like Carrier... Uh, or you've never played Carrier, but you've been thinking about that kind of thing because it's hard to get on the second-hand market. John Southern is um, releasing through Compass Games his follow-up Carrier Battle Philippine Sea uh, about the Great Marianas Turkey Shoot in 1944. Anyway, it's nowhere near as complicated as this. I mean, Carrier is like a 10 on a 1 to 10 in complication. This is like a 3, maybe even a 2. I mean, it's very simple, but it, it's effective. Again, you get the tension, you get the feel, you get the frustration, you get the swings, you get the, you know, nail biting. Oh, here we go. Here come the bombers. Well, did we hit anything? You know, that kind of thing. So, again, I've said this many, many times before, but it is true. You know, simple does not mean simplistic. And this is definitely a simple approach, relatively speaking, to other games. I'm even compared with Flattop, too, which one could argue is the king of carrier games. It probably is, to be honest. But it's effective. It works. It does. It does what it do, does. How am I trying to say this? What it does, it does well. There we go. All right. Another thing I like is these action cards. Okay. Now these are dealt out at the beginning of the game, or if you do the solo method like I do, um, I have. If you're wondering down here, if you look, there's a blue die here. There's a green die here. I assign a different colored die to every carrier, and then I roll to randomly see who gets to activate next. So it's kind of like when you're playing with two people, you don't know who has what cards uh, they have face down and stuff, what they randomly pull, pulled. So 
in this way, I don't know what's coming next. I don't know who's going to be launching planes and who is not. So that's kind of cool. Um, it makes that kind of uh, decision that way, playing by yourself. But I do like it because, you know, it, it keeps the tension. You don't know which card's coming next. Uh, each card is different. As you can see here, you can launch three planes with this one. But if you survive the onslaught of attacks and you're one of the last ones to go, I have six carriers right now, then you get four. Okay, and you have other options too. You can do battle stations, you can fix and launch, you know, that kind of thing. So I like those cards because it keeps the tension. It keeps the guessing game, which was reflective of carrier warfare in 1942. Who's going to get their planes all saddled up, so to speak, and ready to roll? Uh, who's going to be firstest with the mostest kind of thing? Okay. Um, I like the combat cards, too. And let me just show you a sample of those. This is one of the attacker cards here. Um, I like them because I like the design. I like the pictures that they use. The, the frame's a little... Uh, the words that come to mind are cartoonish and cheesy, but it works. It works in the end. But I do like them because of what they can do. Uh, I do like them because of the wide variety of things that are possible. I like the... You can see the bullseye here, which cancels out the other player's card. Uh, that provides different scenarios and swings and stuff. Um, because, again, if, if you study the carrier battles, and I've studied them a lot over the years, there was so much luck and so many little things that were involved that made them extremely swingy. Um, you know, it's it's amazing, the margin of error, so to speak. You know, like how they say that football is a game of inches? It's amazing. Same kind of concept uh, with the carrier warfare that was going on. So I do like the cards. You know, you have your uh, dogfight cards, you have your attack cards, and you have your defense cards. Uh, and, and I like all of them. They give you extra dice to roll or hits or, or things like that. They cancel things out. They, they give you extra dice to fight with, so to speak. Uh, I really enjoy that, too. The other thing I like about the game is you have all the carriers that were available to both sides. And I like the fact that they got the pictures. So, like, here you got this Wukaku. Um... And again, you know, they got the picture. Now, granted, I mean, this side, they kind of, you know, added the smoke. <laughs> you can kind of see that superimposed and stuff. But you got every single, you know, carrier here. You got the big dogs, you know, the Kagi and stuff. But then you also have this Ryoho, you know, or like I have out here, the Shoho in the rain. <laughs> I, always, I don't know why I do that, but that, that always makes me think of the Shoho, makes me think of Soho in the rain, Werewolves of London for the Warren Zevon fans. But I like the fact that they're all here. It's not just the big carriers. But it's also the little carriers, which, of course, the U.S. really was not using escort carriers in the Pacific at this point. But the Japanese were, and, and they're there, and I like that, okay? I also like the fact that in the playbook, operations manual, as they call it, you have all the battles. So there's an order of battle for every one of the four major carrier engagements. You have Coral Sea, Midway, Eastern Solomons, and Santa Cruz. Okay, they're all there. All right, and of course, again, the shocking thing as I got older and, and suddenly realized this at one point, I forget when, I think it was in college at some point, that I was just like, holy smoke, you know, all this emphasis. People talk about the carriers in the Pacific, the carriers, the carriers, they supplemented the battleship, blah, blah, blah. You know, or supplanted rather the battleship. And it's just like there was only five. That's it. Five. You know, cinco, pinch in Polsky. Five, count them, five major carrier engagements. That was it. Carrier versus carrier. It's crazy to think about. But all the battles for 1942 are here. Um, and I'm sure if you wanted to, you probably could easily come up with a way to to um, get the 1944 battles figured out. Uh, battle figured out, too. Um, the other thing I like about the game, another good thing, is it has its own set of campaign rules. So, and I've played the campaign a number of times. I've done four battles, just like, you know, happened in 1942. And they give you, for each one here, they give you the different strengths for each carrier. All the carriers are covered. The light carriers, the main Japanese carriers, the U.S. carriers, depending on, you know, which ones you designate as the first big ones and the second big ones and stuff. It's all here. So you can design your own scenario. So you can go completely, uh, and there's a record sheet. To keep track. You know, you can start historically with the Coral Sea and then go from there with the other battles. Or you can just do what I do. I'm, you know, I just go ahead and randomly 
you know, play it. Sometimes I start off with two U.S. carriers, sometimes three, and I start off, of course, always with four Japanese because the Japanese had a tendency to pair their carriers constantly. They didn't, they never really had an odd number as, as far as I can re recollect. But I like that. I like the fact that it's there. I also like the fact that there are solo rules. Now, I've made some of my own solo rules, like I said a little bit ago, before with rolling the dice and stuff. But, you know, the files, and I know there's a second edition to this, and I didn't pick up the second edition. Uh, I'm, I'm very happy with what I have. But some of the stuff that you were able to print before, like this is the solo map for putting down clouds and things like that. Here's the solo rules, some of them um, that were here. I would assume that's incorporated into the rules and you don't have to print them out with the second edition. But the fact that there are those solo rules, uh, that's why up here, let me just move you real quick, in the corner, you have three separate decks for the Japanese. Because uh, you divide them into, you know, dogfight cards, attack cards, and then defense cards. Uh, it's a nice solo rule structure that still keeps the flow of the game and keeps the tension. Uh, I added one little wrinkle. Where for the Japanese, I roll a six-sided die, and if I roll a one, they don't actually get to draw a card. Because, you know, sometimes you're not going to have a card in your hand, or a card that you're going to be like, Shh, I don't want to waste it on this, you know, kind of thing. That sort of feeling. So, uh, I added that little wrinkle to it. But there's nice solo rules for this game, um, which is awesome, okay? I like the dice test, you know, when you're doing um, battles and stuff. So, whenever you have... You know, like, you have this Dauntless here with the two blue dice, and they're going to attack the Soryu, which has two red dice. And it's a very simple system. You know, it's basically whoever has the high uh, roll. You know, so if the if the Dauntless gets a six, the Soryu gets a five, the Dauntless gets through. But it is tense, because when you're rolling those dice, you're like, okay, when you roll, I usually roll for the Japanese first, uh, because I'm usually actively playing the Americans for obvious reasons. You know, it's like, oh, shoot, the Japanese rolled a six and a five, so i got to have at least one six. Come on. Baby needs a brand new pair of shoes, that kind of thing. So I like the tension. I like the dice test because, again, it is kind of, again, it's, it, it reflects the whole system being simple. It, it's a very easy way to simulate that trying to get through the anti-aircraft fire and you know if the other side sees you or they can concentrate their fire etc etc that kind of thing so i really do like the dice tests as well too um and it keeps the tension without having like a billion charts or you know like 50 different modifiers you have to you know work together and add up and then you end up with two plus two to the die roll after looking at 50 different things um this system the system works very well uh, for what it does. So I do like how it keeps the tension, even with keeping things um, simple. Okay. Uh, I like the strike cards. I like the attack cards, how that's worked into the factors. Not only the dice, but you know, extra torpedoes and uh, extra bombers. I also like, as part of the strike, each card here at the bottom, you get to draw two of these and you get to pick the best one. So if you're attacking with torpedo planes, you're like, dude, I want this one because I hit on a one, two, or a three. You know? um, or conversely, if you're doing dive bombing and you pull, oh, let me see if I have a bad card because I'm in the middle of the game, so I don't want to, you know, I don't want to mess my thing up here. But, um, you know, like the difference between these two cards. You know, like the top one there, if you're dive bombing, definitely better because you got two critical hits and you can hit with four things. Whereas down here, the bottom one, you only have one critical hit and you can only hit with three, four, five, and six. So I like the strike cards. I, I like how those cards do double duty too. Uh, well, actually triple duty, to be honest, because the cards here that are used for the strikes, the bottom is the strike. This is for searching, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And then this, of course, is flying. Uh, distance wise to see how much fuel you've used or how far away the enemy actually is kind of thing so I like the strike cards. I think they're I think they're very well done um, and I just kind of mentioned this already but I'm just going to say it again about how this just gives the feel without the overhead now granted this is sprawled out here as you can see I mean this is a pretty big battle area but at the same time you know you're not flipping through things constantly you're not um, having to, to shuffle things or move things around all the time. You know, the cards are easy to manipulate and, and the carrier cards are nice and big. Uh, so I like how, how it does its objective. It achieves its objective without a whole lot of overhead. Uh, another good thing about it is the replay value. Uh, between the dice test and not sure, you know, which carries you're going to have involved and which combat cards you're going to have and which strike cards are going to come out. You know, and who finds who first, you know, with the search phase and things. 
Uh, this is, right now, what you see in front of you. This is my 41st play of this game, which is part of the reason I did this review, because when I was looking at it, I'm like, oh, okay, you know, I haven't played this for a while, or I played it once last year. Uh, oh, yeah, I played it once. I played the Eastern Solomon scenario, because my younger son was born. Um, his birthday is the beginning of uh, that particular battle. But, yeah, I was like, when I looked at the plays, I'm like, oh, 41. I mean, this is one of the games I have played a lot. Um... You know, this is one of my top ten most played games, and especially war games if you throw out things like Legendary and, and games like that that are non-war games. So the replay value on this is huge. There's so much variation that, that is built into the system that it's it's almost ridiculous. You know, you could, you could choke a horse with kind of stuff. You know? um, I also like how the game also reflects the kind of luck that you can have. You know, like what happened at Midway. Because uh, I just had here, one of the last things on the last turn I had was everything was going well for me. And then there was one little Japanese Kate squadron from the Shoho that got through. And you could see what it did to my Enterprise. It's all in flames now because they happened to get lucky. They got the card with the 1-2-3 strike. And they had an extra attack roll from the combat card and an extra torpedo roll and they hit me four times and it was just like holy cow man you know again it's like that luck factor you know sometimes you get that lucky shot and, and a lot that happened a lot of times uh, with this kind of thing you know I think of the Enterprise being the only carrier left after Santa Cruz and having its elevator jammed couldn't even get the planes up and down for crying out loud I mean, it's a good thing the Japanese didn't know that and of course didn't have more carriers themselves that they could have brought down because that could have got dicey down there in the solid so I do like the big swings like that, the big damage, how, you know, you can have three squadrons come through. I had that happen last turn here with the Soryu. I was trying to polish this, it off, and I focused on that instead of the, the lighter carriers. And I had three Dauntlesses attack, three different Dauntlesses, nothing. Didn't even scratch the paint. I was like, what the what he what what? But again, that's kind of like the way carrier warfare was. You know, it was very swingy at times. It was, there was a lot of luck that went on there. It was skill, too. Don't get me wrong. Those dive bomber pilots, those torpedo pilots, that took skill. But, you know, as, as uh, some of the books I've been reading lately, like about Napoleon and Alexander the Great, it's true. You know, to be a winner, to be successful, you also need a certain amount of luck, too, on your side. And, and that is very, very obvious with... Um, carrier warfare the way it was, especially at the beginning of the war before radar really kind of kicked in and became a big factor um, later on down the road. Um, yeah, I mean, that was part of what contributed to the Marianas turkey shoot, quite frankly. So that's the good. There's a lot of good stuff here. I mean, I have, what do I have? Two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve good things. Twelve. Now, on the bad side, um, a couple of things here. And again, this is where you... This is one of those war games where the separation, the cleavage between simulation and game is very clear. Uh, again, if you just compare this to Flat Top or Carrier, uh, I'm trying to think if there's another game um, that falls in that category, but I don't, I don't think so. I think those really are the kings. They're really the elite uh, of this. Uh, there is a big, big difference here. Uh, for that. So, some of the bad things, because again, you know, when I do my reviews, part of what I mention sometimes is some things that don't personally matter to me. Like, some people care about mount of map boards, and I don't, I can care less. I mean, you know, except for something like Cataclysm. That was ridiculous. That was almost TP thing, for crying out loud. But most of the times, you know, there's things that I don't care about, but I tell you, the viewers, just in case, because, you know, if you're thinking about, you know, putting down your hard earned money, it's kind of stuff you might want to know. So uh, one thing that is a bad thing, I think, is there is the search board uh, that you have in the game, but you only do the search once. You take the cards I showed you for the strikes, and you do a 5 by 6 grid, and you search, and that's it. It's just one time. So you don't have any issues with like losing contact or shadowing or anything like that or, or um, uh, misreporting of things. You know, like the, the Coral Sea, when that one scout plane from the U.S., you know, reported a carrier and a destroyer or something, and it turned out just to be a coral reef, which it's hard to grasp that those kind of mistakes were made, but, you know, when you kind of look at some of the footage and stuff, you can see, you know, if you're far away in the shadows on the water and things like that, but um, 
So you're not going to have that here. You're not going to have any issues with maintaining contact or, or doing searches uh, each time around. That That's not really going to happen. The only thing that does is reflected with that is when you first have to find the enemy carriers, it adds an extra step when you're doing flight time, which we'll talk about here in a few moments. Actually, right now. Um, the fuel tank cards. I like it and I don't. I like it because it's very simple way to portray the range that each side have of their aircraft. I mean, the Japanese had greater range, of course, at less armor. But it's also kind of annoying because it is extremely random. And it doesn't kind of correlate with the map. Uh, I know the map is supposed to be an abstraction. You know, the spaces are, you know indicative of searching and looking you know and you do have you know like the midway thing you know the one squadron went the wrong way and the other squadron followed the commander's hunch and all that jazz but uh, i don't I, it just seems a bit too random i guess at times and it's extremely frustrating especially as an american player because you know your fuel especially like you know the dev old devastator torpedo planes i mean the fuel is two so you know the chances of you getting two cards with two fuel tanks uh, there's the cards have either two fuel tanks on them just a few one fuel tank or some have none but the chances of you getting two and your wildcats are also like that you're going to have smoking planes and if you have smoking planes which uh, is the other side of the card uh, like that for those of you not familiar with the game uh, then of course it's going to be easy to, easier to get shot down and be wiped out so yeah the fuel tank thing I'm not the biggest fan of with this um, another thing I'm not a big fan of, and maybe because I'm just not a big fan of the movie, is the whole final countdown scenario. Now, again, Carrier also has this, um, but here's the Nimitz, which, of course, if you're not familiar with the final countdown, um, it's a movie, I think, from 1980 or 1981. I think it was Kirk Douglas that was in it. Um, if I remember, I've only seen it once. And the reason I've only seen it once is because of the ending. Uh, but basically, it's a time warp thing where the Nimitz goes back in time and ends up uh, at, around Pearl Harbor on December 6th. And, of course, you know, all those guys know what's coming the next day. So, yeah. Um, the ending is just... I, I, I remember after I watched it, the only time I've ever watched it, I've watched it once. At the end, I was just like, what the fire truck was that? Because that was just ridiculous, you know. So, I'm not a big fan of the final countdown scenario. I mean, you know, F-14s against Zeros and Vals. Come on, man. What the? Yeah, okay. Anyway, I, I'm sorry. I, I guess I like to spend my time with something that's a little more realistic, which is saying a lot. Because, as you all know, I enjoy sandbox games. Um, yeah, so that's... Yeah, okay. Um, another thing I, that's bad about the game is there's no accounting for combo creation. What I mean by that is this. If you launch an attack against, say, the Sodi, or even the Japanese are attacking the Yorktown, you know, if you attack with both Val dive bombers and Kate torpedo planes, there's no extra bonus for that. You know, other games, you get extra stuff because, you know, you're forcing the enemy cap to go, you know, high and low. Uh, but, or I guess you could say high or low, but it, that doesn't exist in this. And, and since it was such a big tactic and people have talked about it and, you know, the sacrifice of Torpedo Squadron 8 at Midway, you know, uh, what happened there, it just seems like there should be something to it. But I, I was looking through the rules again and maybe second edition rules, there is something, um, you know, I probably should get a hold of them at some point. I did look them over and I didn't see a whole lot of difference, but, you know, I don't remember when I looked at them and stuff. But, um, yeah, it, it, it's, it's, it just seems a little odd, you know, since most other games do incorporate that. Uh, the other thing I think is bad is you have repair points, uh, the Admiral's phase, um, which, by the way, in the original set of rules was not clear that you got to do it after every carrier activation. Um, because in the original rules, let me show you here, the original rules you can see here, you see how basically how the arrows run, you know? And look, the Admiral phase is below this. So when I first started playing this, I thought the Admiral phase only happened once. Um, but, I mean, it does say complete after the carrier action is finished. But, well, wait, carrier action. So does that mean the carrier turn or each carrier individually? That was not clear. Um, 
So I'm assuming, I, I believe that was that was fixed for the second edition. But um, yeah, it, 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 the, the being able to use those points, you can use them to repair your ships and stuff, but you can also use them to retrieve planes from the watery grave, uh, which goes to victory points for, uh, for the other side. I think that's a bit too gamey because I mean, let's face it. If you're fighting, you know, Coral Sea or Midway or whatever and stuff, I mean, I can think of no instance where any of the carriers got, you know, planes from somewhere else. I mean, if a carrier sinks, that's one thing. But I don't know. It just seems too. It's it, it seems too gamey to me. I never do it because I, I just don't think. I just don't think it's it's a good rule. So I never, ever, ever, ever use it okay so that's the bad in the game from my perspective and that's less than half that's five things and a few of the things you know you could argue you know like the search only once per turn and stuff i mean it is is feasible and of course the final countdown thing is extremely subjective the only ugly thing i will say and i mention this only because again for what this game is i like it i have fun with it uh and again if i don't want to put the time investment into play flat top or to play a carrier. This is a good substitute because again, it gives me the same feel, the same tension, the, the, the same experience without the amount of time investment, I guess is what I'm trying to say with that. So I will say, just so you know, because you probably don't see it here, um, and if you've never seen my playthrough videos, by the way, you should look at those. Now, compared to what I've done recently, those are kind of, um, well, I mean, I made them when I started this almost three years ago. It was one of the first games I highlighted on my channel. So for lack of a better way to put it, compared to what I think I do nowadays, I think that's what's kind of um, primitive, if you will. Uh, you can look at those to see how the mechanics work. But the one ugly thing I will say, because I know a lot of people like this, is there's no carrier operations here. So you don't have each turn, like, again, in the game carrier, you don't have to, you know, decide who's being armed, who's on the deck, who's going to be landed, uh, who's circling and trying to land. There's none of that. There's none of the actual carrier operations. Because as you can see from the carrier cards here, you know, there's nothing internal going on, so to speak. So one could argue that's probably the ugly part of this game. Uh, again, for me... It's not a big deal because again I like the system. I, I like what it's what it does and what it doesn't do doesn't bother me much. That's a lot of dozens in the same sentence, isn't it? Uh, but it's true. I mean what the game does I like. What's lacking doesn't bother me a whole lot. Okay. And then if it does, like if I really want to get a very intense experience, then I'll go pull out carrier or I'll pull out flat top. Uh, but a lot of times you know, when I just want to have fun with it, so to speak, this would be the game. So there's no carry operations here, so don't be looking for that. Don't be looking for trying to figure out, you know, who needs servicing, you know, down below deck and stuff. Uh, if you're going to be able to catch, you know, Japanese planes on the deck, no, that's, that's not going to happen. Not in this game. No. So, so there you have it. Um, the good, the bad, and the ugly of Fires of Midway. All right. And again, when I realized that there was just this glaring oversight on my part. I was like, dude, I have to fix this. I have to make a make amends. Not, maybe not amends. I have to 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 fix the oversight. There we go. That's a better way of putting it. So, all right. As for the future, uh, the Munich War is still in the works. Uh, I was playing that again, brushing up on it. Uh, so I'm ready for the playthrough. So I think I'll be doing that sometime in the next week or so. I'm still trying to decide which scenario to go with because, I mean, logically, I know, you're probably all sitting there thinking, well, the logical one is the one where France and Britain say to Hitler, hey, head off, you jag off. Um, no, nah, you, you keep your grubby mitts off Czechoslovakia. And then, of course, you know, Hitler's like, whatevs. And then next thing you know, you know, we got a, a rumble in the jungle, so to speak. Um that scenario. But there's other scenarios too. The Little Entente one. Uh, I just finished the anti common turn one, which is basically, you know, Italy and, and Germany and Poland, which again, a lot of people don't realize how much um, from about oh, 1934 to 36, give or take, even 37 a little bit, uh, Hitler was courting the Poles. Uh, 
was trying to be friends with them. It's amazing. Again, that book Enemy in the East is is very eye opening, um, and it's and it's it's a well respected book too. Um, but anyway, but I just finished that where they were attacking you know Czechoslovakia and the Soviet Union and Romania were on the other side. But there's also a nightmare one for poor Eastern Europe where it's basically one side is the Soviets and the Nazis, and is basically the countries in Eastern Europe stuck in between with the possibility of French intervention. Interestingly enough, though, no British, so, um, yeah. But anyway, so that's still in the works. Uh, I'm still playing around with Black Swan, which uh, is very interesting, but there keeps being things coming up, clarifications and stuff, so I'm kind of waiting for that to settle down a little bit before I really kind of dive into it. Uh, and then, like I said, I have this Lost Valley coming, which is something that should be coming down the pipe. And then I finally got my hands on it. I'll just show you this real quick and then I'll finish and sign off here. But uh, I finally got my hands on a copy of this, uh, Democracy Under Siege, which there's a companion game called Rise of Totalitarianism, uh, which comes before that. But this is very much like a, um, if you're not familiar with it, I'll just show you real quick here. This is very much like a um, kind of like Twilight Struggle sort of thing uh, going on. Um, between you know communism, fascism, and democracy. So, uh, so I'm going to mess with that eventually here too. Just not sure when uh, or where it's right now, where it lies on the priority list. So, okay. So there you have it. A lot of other things. A lot of things coming down the pike. A lot of things I'm looking at uh, for the future here. Um, so, as always, stay tuned and check out my channel to see what new goodies I have. And again. I, um, just want to say thanks to everybody um, you know, who watches the channel and stuff and subscribes. Uh, I do appreciate it. Um, you know, I, I was a teacher for 14 years, and um, you know, I enjoyed it. It was it was a lot of fun, um, and you know, I, I think I have a reasonable knack for for conveying things and and and, and um, teaching things. So this kind of lets me continue to do that as you know, I raise my two boys um, here at home. So um, yeah. So anyway, so I'm glad I can be of help, and I, and I appreciate the, uh, the support for the channel. All right, so next time, uh, more than likely, I know I said this before, but <laughs> I think I really mean it this time, more than likely Munich War, but it also could be uh, Diem Vim Few, that last valley, so we'll see. All right, either way, um, I guess the big thing, the bottom line with this review here is that if you don't mind some of the simplicity of this game, and some of the things it's missing, this game is, well, there's no other way to put it. This game is a hell of a lot of fun. So, that's the bottom line. All right, so this is Tim Korchley from Bare Bones Wargaming saying thanks for watching. And I think I will see you from 1938 Europe next time. But, um, well, you never know. Or as one of my favorite quotes of all time it is anything can happen and it often does and that is true all right thanks for watching see you next time